Don't mind yourself. Am I, I was thinking, am I on or not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hope I'm not coming through the, the live stream. Let's let's uh, we can tell the world what we really think of Pastor Robert Adair. Well, good evening. It's a joy uh, to have you with us. Please do continue to help yourselves to tea and coffee. If you get bored during the service, help yourselves to tea and coffee. Uh, it's there to be eaten and drank, so please uh, do that. It's great to have you along at Cafe Church tonight, whether you're here in person or you're watching online. Uh, we do pray that as we come together tonight that... Uh, we would be blessed and encouraged by our time of fellowship together. Tonight, it's uh, three Presbyterians and a Baptist. And, uh, you know, somebody come up and says, be easy on them. Uh, I'll try. I'll try my best. Um, 
don't throw eggs or rotten tomatoes. If you're going to do that, wait till we're outside the building. Uh, we would appreciate that. Um, but it's great that we have been able to come together tonight. And uh, I'm just going to introduce myself and then going to introduce the, let the guys introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Robert Adair. I'm the Baptist minister of this fine establishment. Uh, I am married to Gemma. I have two kids, Macy and Harry, who are down at the back. Um, so if you hear children screaming, they're mine. Um, <laughs> so uh, we uh, have been here at Allness for six years now. Uh, hard to believe, and they still haven't fired me yet. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, and so I'll hand over. My name's Brian, and I'm the minister at Invergordon Church of Scotland. I was wearing a purple shirt yesterday, and Robert's wearing a purple shirt this evening. I'm assuming he's copied my fashion styles. Um, and I've been there for eight months, and I have um, my wife, Talita, is from Brazil, I will say that, and I've got three girls, uh, Esther, who's seven, uh, Lydia, who's five, and Bethany, who's ten weeks. So um, this is very complex for me this evening, all these questions because mainly the noises I've been making at home are <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's, uh, just trying to get my brain in gear. Nice to see you all this evening, though. Good evening, everyone. My name's Phil Gunn. I'm the minister at Roskeen Parish Church, just down the road in, uh, further down in Onness. I've been there for three years as their minister. Uh, my wife is Claire, and I've got three children, Anna, Ben, and Beth, in that age order. And, uh, yeah, it's exciting to come and be challenged by some questions tonight and uh, sort of petrifying at the same time. So, Okay, I'm Cal Honda. I am the minister at Roskeen Free Church. I've been the minister there. Uh, I've been in ministry for 13 years. I've been the minister for six years. Uh, married to Christina. Two very hyper boys at home. JJ, who's four and a half, and Benjamin, who is eight months. So if I doze off, it's not because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not fully engaged with what we're doing tonight. It is because Benjamin still hasn't learned how to sleep very well. So I have coffee, so we should be okay. <laughs> well, it's good to, to come together. And guys, maybe the first question, just so people get to know us a, a bit more, um, and I'll start with Honda and we'll work our way back, is maybe how you came to ministry, brief and concise. I know we can do it, guys. Uh, but you, you invited three Presbyterians. We're not I, renowned I, I for being brief or concise. I, I am challenging myself as well as you guys. But just, you know, just a, a brief synopsis of how you, you came to, you know, ministry and, and faith, if you can do Oh, I can do that very quick. And faith as well. Uh, See, well. You're making this harder and harder, Robert. Uh, very quick testimony in that I was brought up in a Christian household. Always believed the Bible to be true but found my experience at church to be deathly dull. Always believed it was true, knew I needed Jesus before I died, but I was one of those, I'm going to put it off till I'm older, put it off till I'm older. But the Lord just always had a hold of my life, and, you know, I had to just avoid anything to do with spiritual things because it pricked my conscience, it bothered me. And when I was 23, the Lord just laid hold of me, brought some trouble into my experience, I won't go into that. But... It just made me realize my life was going down a road that was not a good road, shall we say, and I could see where it was headed, and it's just like a voice in my head says, you know what you need to do. You've known for years what you need to do. You need to make a commitment to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So I did that when I was age 23. Um, about a year later, something in the back of my head was to do with ministry, and Believe this or not, those of you who know me, I'm very shy. I hate public speaking. I hate loads of people looking at me in a situation like this. Um, even doing a talk in English class in school, I'd be terrified for months ahead, oh, I'm going to have to speak publicly. So I thought this was ridiculous. And I prayed this night and I said, Lord, show me if it's the ministry one way or the other, thinking the Lord will go, don't be so silly, just relax. And I opened the Bible and I'd open it, Isaiah 49. It is too small a thing that you should be my servant, says the Lord. But I have chosen you to bring back the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. The Lord your God has chosen you. Next night I said, there's been a terrible mistake. That can't be the right answer. So if it's a ministry, show me. And when I went to bed at night, opened my Bible, exactly the same page. It's just too small a thing that you should be my servant, says the Lord. The Lord your God has chosen you. I ran from it for a year, but the Lord brought people into my life where I could run from it no longer. And I, I just had to make that step. I just felt I couldn't live my life knowing the Lord wanted to be in ministry and not doing it. So I took the plunge and applied for ministry. 
Grand. Oh, that's very loud. <laughs> you keep me I, awake, thanks. Indeed, yeah. What I, I like, Callum, was uh, brought up in a Christian household. I gave my life to Christ at the age of 12, but to be honest, I drifted. And it wasn't until I went to university that I suddenly... And it was my choice to make the decision whether I go to church or not. Because up until then, it was just mum and dad took you and there was no choice in the household. You got taken. So when I went to university, it was suddenly my choice and I went to church and... I think the, the standout moment for me was one week when I missed the cell group that the students went to and I really missed that sense of fellowship and that studying the Bible together that suddenly clicked in my mind that this is definitely my faith that I am truly believing now. And, and so after that, it's kind of, I ended up working for Scripture Union for a year in their gap year program down at Lendrick Muir. And following that, I ended up as a youth worker for six years out at Kintore Parish Church in Aberdeenshire which led to me then becoming a parish assistant in Aberdeen and then led to me starting my training to be a minister. And for me, that whole process was very much a step by step, a very gradual process. Because like Callum, I dreaded public speaking. At university for two weeks before I was due to do a public talk, I would be unable to eat or sleep properly because I was so terrified of doing it. And so again, that same thought of, I couldn't possibly be up there, I couldn't be the minister. What are you on about, Lord? Don't be, a, you're having a laugh, surely. And he wasn't. <laughs> and um, she brought me up here to kind of train and slowly the process grew and grew. And I think that that slow, gradual process for me was important because otherwise I'd have done a Jonah and run far away, screaming away from the calling God has brought me to. So he's plonked me here in Allness to, to be a minister here in Allness. So it's how I've ended up here. Great. Well, that's great to hear your guys' stories. And I feel I have something in common with you in that I was also brought up in a Christian home, but that myself and Phil were on the same year group um, for training for ministry in the Church of Scotland, and when I was a teenager, um, I remember Callum Honda uh, at the Bayhead Youth Group in Stornoway, where I felt my faith flourish um, as I was brought up in the Free Church and converted there. Um, uh, two you know, wonderful parents who, who really helped me and guided me, and who really are my biggest influences. Um, but I felt I made my own decision in uh, going to a church, Mark's Memorial in Stornoway, where there was uh, musical, musical instruments, and that was the only reason I uh, moved away from the free church um, and, and, and really flourished there and uh, moved to Edinburgh, studied music, um, did some stuff with Christian music ministry, and I thought if I was to become a minister, I would never be holy enough. That's the typical kind of Highland and Island kind of answer. Or if I was, I might be 40 or 50 at least, um, <laughs> have enough life experience. But I went to an Alpha day away, and uh, the associate minister at Holy Trinity Wester Hales, uh, Ian Africa MacDonald, again another Lewisman, uh, came alongside me, prayed for me, and he said, Brian, I've just got this, this wee prompting that, uh, I don't know if it rings true, but I, I feel like the Lord might be calling you to ministry sooner than you think, and I, and, and I knew <laughs> that what he was saying was, uh, was right, and uh, I went forward, uh, went through the process of the Church of Scotland, and it's, uh, yeah, I had a really blessed experience, I must say, uh, going through um, but all that might be said in the Church of Scotland and the training process, I've had a really good experience, so I must give honor where honor's due. And uh, yeah, I spent the first um, couple of years in ministry, uh, finished my probation period at Mark's Memorial Church, where I became a member first as a teenager, and then um, uh, went back to, to and, and then continued on as the assistant minister, uh, working alongside Tommy McNeil, who was such a great influence with me uh, as a teenager. And then my minister in Holy Trinity, Kenny Borthwick, also came and joined the pastoral team at Martin. So it was great to be alongside these two guys who I admire so uh, greatly and uh, to learn from them too. So that's kind of my journey into ministry. Uh, yeah, in a summary. Well, I feel like the black sheep now because I didn't grow up in a Christian family. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I grew up in Northern Ireland amidst all the wonderful complexities that that brings. Um, I was in high school when the Oma bomb went off, so you know it was as relevant to me as it has been to uh, my parents' generation and my grandparents' generation. Um, and it was a, an encounter one night. Um, you know, parents were going through a, a difficult spot, and uh, I was sitting in a brethren hall of all places, a, a kids' club, and um, you know, this guy says, "If you were to walk out tonight and get hit by a bus, where were you going?" Um, you know, don't leave this place without making a decision. And, you know, to be honest, uh, home at li life at home was rubbish. Uh, and I said, well, God, if you want to take this life and use it, then here it is. Do with it what you want. Um, it's a very dangerous prayer to pray to God. Very dangerous. Um, 
But I had every intention in being the next Gordon Ramsay, the world-renowned chef, uh, just without the swearing. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I wanted to be a chef. I, I, I qualified in, uh, as, a, as a chef and, and went through all my qualifications. Um, and it was actually uh, an American mission team uh, which was brought into a housing scheme not too dissimilar to, uh, you know, West End or Milnafur where I grew up. Uh, you know, drug problems, alcohol problems, uh, social depravity, all that was evident. Uh, and this crazy Nashvilleian lady uh, came up to me and went, you are the shepherd boy, not yet become the king. And I'm like, what? But that, that's what she said, you're the shepherd boy, not yet become the king. Uh, and I just took it and put it at the back of my head. And um, it was through the Reverend Steve Burton um, that led those teams. He invited me to go over and do catering for youth camps uh, in Florida, Christian youth camps. And that opened my eyes to just uh, a world that I would never experience. And if you've ever tried to cook uh, for 15,000 young people and students, that's also a life experience. Uh, up at half five in the Floridian heat, uh, uh, getting breakfast, lunch and dinner ready. Uh, and uh, I was walking along the Gulf of Mexico, as you do, uh, you know, humble little ballerina man. Um, and I heard this voice saying, I, I want you to, to serve me. And so I came back home and told my minister and said, I want to go to Bible college. And he went, nope, um, smart man. Um, <laughs> But I, I went ahead um, and, you know, I, it, it took me a while. I did three years at Belfast Bible College. Uh, then due to ill health and, and, and other things, I, I stepped back uh, from studies there. Uh, and it was another six years. And then in uh, 2012, I was invited by Steve back over to do the university uh, version of the camp. And I was walking along the Gulf of Mexico again and God's speaking to me, he says, you haven't done what I've asked you? I'm like, yeah. Um, and the day before I arrived in Florida, I had went to the Irish Bible Institute and put an application in, not thinking that I would get back into study too many years have passed. And when I was there, they went, nope, we'll take you. I was like, oh, great. Um, <laughs> so that was down in Dublin. Um, so back and forth from Dublin for a year. Uh, and then many of you may know Daniel, who's my best friend uh, from Coastline. Uh, he was at Bible College with me, and he had an American mission team, and you know me, I'm drawn to American mission teams, uh, to come over and help with the catering. Uh, and, and then I met a Fife lass, and then life just went downhill from there, uh, <laughs> uh, to be quite honest. And uh, yeah, I... I, I was over helping them write their youth uh, and community workers description and five people during that time says, would you do it? I went, no, I wrote the job description. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> um, and I, I left going home, leaving Gemma crying on the doorstep and Daniel shouting at me in the car way back at the Edinburgh airport. And I got home and there was a, an email from one of the deacon's wives in size font 59 writing, please, please, please consider being our youth worker. And there were just too many coincidences and uh, uh, phone Daniel because going into ministry with your best friends not advised, but we did it anyway. Um, and uh, I served there for three and a half years and then Allness and their great glorious wisdom and uh, decision uh, decided to ask me to be their minister and I still remember Pauline Chalmers shouting in the background, does he know what he's letting himself in for? Um, wise sage words, Pauline. And no, I didn't. Um, but I've been blessed uh, uh, as I've served here for the last six years. And, you know, it, it, it's been a blessing and an encouragement. Um, so that's, that's kind of where our ministry journeys have been. Um, but it's good to know that because, you know, it's a Q&A of life, ministry, theology, and the universe. Anything's uh, on the cards tonight. But we have been given some questions in advance of this evening. Um, I know my church secretary has been telling people not to and wait to the open uh, panel part of it. Uh, so we're, we're all looking forward to that, aren't we, gentlemen? What? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Um, but uh, as we um, come tonight, and I've lost my question list. Ah. Where did it go? There we go. Um, one of the, the questions that have been submitted is this. 
morality, we're going to start off easy, okay? Morality has and is changing in the world and the society in which we live. When do we adapt as Christians in love or should we be more steadfast to the old standards and ways? Who wants to kick that one off? <laughs> I guess that's me. I'll, I'll go first. I'll start the ball rolling and then you can correct my heresies afterwards. How's that? Gladly. Um, what I'd say about that is I think when we're called to follow Jesus, that means he's our Lord. He's our Savior and our Lord, which means what he says goes. So as Christians, our calling is not to adapt to the world, but to adapt to Jesus, to, to, say, to, fo to follow what he says. And that's always going to cut across the society in which we live. You know, it's not a new thing. I think most of us maybe grew up in what we might call a Christian country. I don't think there's really such a thing as a Christian country. There's a controversial statement you can pull apart later. But um, you look at the Bible times, they did not live in cultures that, that kept the same morality as, as the Lord. They just didn't. But as the church, they were called to, to be different. And what Jesus is calling us to be is a community that's different to the world in which we live. You know, the old illustration is where, where fish are swimming upstream, swimming in a different direction to everybody else, which includes our morality. So... We derive it from Jesus. The world in which we live will not. And maybe we, and of course we, we're to, we have the benefit of being able to have a political system where we can push for change and things like that. But I don't think we should first and foremost expect a non-Christian world to conform to Christian standards. But as the church, we can live that out and be a witness that will draw people in to be different. Silence. There we go. There you go. Any additions to that? I think I was going to say that we're called to, as you were saying, to live in Christ's way. So we're to love the world. And that means that although morality around us is changing, we're called to love people no matter who they are, what they're doing, whatever their gender or sexual identity, whatever that is, we're called to love everyone as they are, not to change them, but to love them as they are. And if they become Christians and we can talk to them about that more and, and, and love to it rather than tell them you're doing it wrong, it's... We need to approach everything out of Christ's love and say to them, we love you the way you are, but this is what Jesus is saying, but we can't change them until, or challenge them on that particularly easily until they become Christians themselves because they don't understand it. So we're called to love them as they are and bring them into our fellowship and to Christ's fold so we can then start teaching them what Christ teaches us, to, to live more like Christ wants us to live. Yeah, some really good points made. I think um, adapting in love, yeah, sure, we, we, we adapt in love and we seek to follow Christ's lead in, in his way and how he loved people um, and at the same time uh, s remain steadfast to, to the old standards and they are old standards because there are the Bible standards and that, that's a high standard and, uh, you know, as has already been said, it's a, it's a call to live a holy and separate life and to be, um, I think it's one guy says, a, a creative minority uh, and, and to really stand out and I think if we were to look back to 2010 you know there's been a real turning point the, the, the transgender conversation that wasn't even on the table just, just in 2010 um, but, but since then just a mere 12, 13 years later it's, it's right at the centre of, of conversation you can't switch on the TV without where it's seeing uh, on the mainstream news something about it and of course it's right in the news at the moment in Scotland um, and so we're always looking to see how, how can we respond as Christians uh, in love um, but at the same time in grace and with grace and in truth um, and it's a hard one and I think there's a lot of resources coming out now which have been proving really helpful um, sometimes from non-Christians the likes of you know Jordan Peterson has been saying a lot of interesting things even though he's not a Christian uh, Douglas Murray who, who himself is a, is a gay man uh, and a Church of England choir boy but but it describes himself as an atheist he said a lot of really good things to say about um, identity and, and in terms of gender and, and sexual identity um, but there's a lot of good Christian pastors and theologians you know responding really well there's a guy in America called Preston Sprinkle who who's is a great theologian and, and he uh, speaks a lot about um, uh, these issues but from a biblical traditional standpoint but it's really involved within the LGBTQ um, community and that's an American kind of viewpoint but I've just picked up this book this week I've not read it and I guess you shouldn't 
recommend a book that you've not read, but it's got a lot of good recommendations. It's a guy called Andrew Bunt, and he's a pastor in, uh, in England. And he describes himself as same-sex attracted, um, but yet lives a celibate life. And it's a, a book called Finding Your Best Identity, a short Christian introduction to identity, sexuality, and gender. And he's really addressing the question around um, how, how we can uh, say that the, the biblical traditional position holds up, but at the same time hold that, have that conversation with people and respond in love. So yeah, um, adapt in love. Yeah, we're always looking to learn how to respond well, but uh, remaining true to the traditional standards of, of the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose for, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, Jesus tells us, you know, to be in the world, but not of the world. Um, and, and, and I think also, you know, as Christians, as, as we live our lives, you know, we are not perfect. And, you know, society portray us as being perfectionists, and we are not. We are broken, sinful people, but we are saved by the grace of God. Um, and, and, and in being saved by the grace of God, we are then called uh, to, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, but also to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and I think that the challenge for the, the church and for Christianity, even as morality changes, even as society changes, even as culture changes, is to hold fast to the great commandment that has always been to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. You may not agree with him, you may disagree with him, but we are called as Christians uh, to love and to show love and to show grace and to show mercy. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, we, we need to remind ourselves of that on a daily basis. We need to remind ourselves of what that great commission and commandment is in the, in the Christian walk day by day as, as we live our life in this world. You know, Jesus told us it wouldn't be easy. There will be trouble, there'll be strife, there'll be heartache, there'll be, you know, you know it, it's, it's a difficult life to live. It's not an easy life to live. As, you know, as Callum says, you know, even in the culture when Jesus was uh, teaching and preaching, you know, the, the world around him was far from a, a moral and pure uh, place. It was high, uh, probably even worse than today with uh, immorality. Uh, and so there is that challenge. The next question um, is one regarding worship. Um, kneeling and dancing are some of the biblical responses found in Scripture. Why have we removed them out of our worship? And I'm looking to three Presbyterians to answer that. <laughs> oh. I've not seen you dancing either. <laughs> That's why it was removed from worship. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's a hard one. Um, I, I think as churches have progressed, you know, we, we, we have lost that, probably that sense of, of what that Kiona community as described in Acts looks like, that, 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 that uh, original biblical community of, of togetherness. And, you know, we, we had uh, Fred Drummond yesterday from Evangelical Alliance at, at Brian's church, um, you know, reminding us we live in, in such a me-orientated society and culture. You know, we come to worship, and we may not agree with this statement, but it's true. We come get asking, what will we get from this experience? It's not what can we give to this experience, but what can we get from this experience? And, you know, the, the way in, in our worship, we, you know, we, we have changed it, and it's... You know, we have made it and into such a way in which, you know, if we run past 12 o'clock or we run past that, you know, and the chicken's burning, you're going to get leashed. You know, the, the congregation begin to twitch in their seats. Um, so, and I, I, I've had it. I, I, I've had it that I was preaching in the church not too far from here, and I ran over by 15 minutes, and uh, I got it in the neck. Um, you know, but the, the, the sense of, you know, we... We try to reduce everything, and so our experience of worship in modern culture probably doesn't, you know, those things are also a cultural thing as well. I'm not saying that to, to get out of the question, um, but I think as we have been more reformed in our, in our theology and understanding, there's been a, a greater emphasis on, on the Word of God, on the preaching and teaching, um, 
of, of God's word uh, and so the, the other things like kneeling in prayer um, my problem is I just can't get back up again once you get down it's, it's getting back up um, you know dancing if you want to dance I'm all for it but be in time be in rhythm you know if you're going to dance do it well um, you know that but you know I, I, I think that is part of the reason when Reformation and, and, and theology of change has came, you know, the things that the church maybe held uh, traditionally important became secondary um, because we gave greater emphasis to the teaching of God's word uh, and, and to the preaching of God's word. Um, you want to bring it back? You want to get down your knees? I'm all for it, you know. Um, you want to dance? You know, uh, I'm all for it. I think it comes to also to the, the sense of, you know, we have non-Christians uh, in our worship, uh, and it, it, coming into a church out of Christian context is, is foreign at the best of time, but, you know, you come in and you start seeing people dancing in the aisles and people up and down and up and down and, and, and praying, and, you're like, they're, you know, it, it can be a culture shock in that regard um, you know and I know that for some people some people just don't feel comfortable doing it and and so for the sense of the brother and sister alongside us I think we have maybe adapted so much to, to be comfortable in, in our styles of worship that you know that has become part and parcel of, of how we do worship um, Presbyterian brethren lead on this is the question I was most interested in. Um, I am a Presbyterian, um, but the churches that I've been in are, I've, I've been Presbyterian charismatic. Um, Mark's Memorial in Lewis is, is known for being, oh, that's the wishy-washy charismatic church. It, it's just, it's, you know, it, it's got that, uh, in Holy Trinity, Wester Hales, you know, it's, it's, it's known for being more charismatic and Kenny Borthwick and, and clan and all that stuff. Um, and I'm saying I'm most personally invested in this question because uh, being called here to Invergordon, and I, and I love it, um, but I really do miss the expressiveness of worship. I really miss it because I think there's a real power in, in being expressive in our worship. I just think, you know, sometimes what, what, what holds us back from, from raising our hands in worship if we go to a football match and we can be really, oh, go for a little one, one Ross County, or, and then, amen. <laughs> That's it, Laura. <laughs> it's so true. Um, but then we come to church, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong. You know, it's 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 a matter of the heart. We know, and uh, you know, I've been in a church service where where someone's maybe just like really, um, for lack of a better word, just quite quite serious. And then at the end, say, wow, that really impacted me. And uh, I know we all have different ways of worshiping. But to get to the actual heart of the question, kneeling and dancing, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just tell a story um, from Holy Trinity Wester Hales, um, and and having mentioned that it is a more charismatic church, they. they um, there was one time the, you know, usually the format of an evening service would be uh, an intro, a prayer, um, reading scripture, and then about half an hour of song worship, uh, 40 minutes of the preached word, and then perhaps a time of a response prayer ministry. Um, uh, not always like that, but that was the general format. Uh, one time the, the worship extended a little bit, and I'd be playing in the, in the band. I wasn't there that particular evening, but one of the ladies, and she had, she had quite a middle class background, middle class Edinburgh, um, she started doing cartwheels around the church and uh, Kenny Borthwick at the front and he, he's told, told the story before he went oh you know I know I know we're kind of kind of char known as be charismatic and that and you know raise our hands and whatever um, but that's too far that's too much uh, and he said that he was doing a devotional uh, later on that week and I think was he reading about uh, in the book of Samuel and he was looking at you know maybe he was going to the original text or the original uh, languages and uh, one of the commentators described that uh, David dancing before the Lord, it was, it was as if he was doing cartwheels. And he went, oh, and he felt so convicted, actually. You know, that lady, she, she would have been the, perhaps the least likely candidate in the church to, to do that, but she felt at that particular moment that was a, a response that she maybe never did again. Um, but it was quite a brave thing to do as well, to do a cartwheel <laughs> in the church. But, but at the same time, yeah, it's, um, uh, yeah, for, for me, I, 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 when I began as a teenager, and I guess you're encouraged to, began raising my hands in worship and then being a drummer, playing at various Christian conferences um, and seeing people do that and seeing how it wasn't just 
oh, they're going with the motions, they're going with the flow. But they, they were really expressing their love uh, to God and not just singing about God, which is great. It's important. We need both. But, but there was a real sense of, of intimacy there. And that's what I think corporate worship can bring. Um, and that's why we need psalms. That's why we need um, hymns, and as well as, as I, I believe, mo- modern songs. And, and I'm, I guess that's why um, my my uh, love of modern worship music and my first dissertation in uni what was on that and why I, why I love it so because uh, there's been that kind of uh, heritage now over the last 50 years of people um, encountering God in, in fresh ways and, and through music and through uh, different postures of worship and uh, can yeah be really helpful I think I think it's awesome Alan we're very British a lot of us we're British how many of you are willing to raise your hands just now <laughs> a few Excellent. <laughs> well, absolutely, yep. Yeah. When, when I was a student in Aberdeen, I went to, it was called City Church, it's now part of the vineyard. I, there were flags waving, there were people up doing all sorts of things, and I never got as far as flag waving, that always felt too hard. I did get as far as raising my hands, but there were several times you would just feel uncomfortable doing it. And I think it was part of us being British is we don't like to kind of be out, seen on, up the front almost, or being seen doing something different. And, if the congregation's not doing that around you, you feel very uncomfortable doing that. Um, and yet it can be very enlivening and uh, very encouraging when you do do that. Um, if you want to come to Roskeen and dance, you can come down the front and dance with my daughter because she dances every week at, uh, at the front of church, much to the delight of many. You're more than welcome to come and dance in Roskeen Parish anytime you want or, or wave your hands or what have you. But I think there's an element also that we're we're kind of British, we don't do that sort of thing in kind of, we're right and proper when we're in church and and that's kind of something that seems to have carried on from the past as well, I think there's an element of that to it as well I don't have a lot to add to the brothers, I've got a wee boy who dances away down the front whenever <laughs> the, the praise is on as well and I suppose it's for me it's a bit about balance because I think there should be a place for spontaneity in our worship rather than just kind of well we stand, we stand to sing, sit, stand, sit, stand and out. You know, I think it's good to have a place for spontaneity, for expressing ourselves, whether it's lifting our hands or whatever and whisper it. It even happens in the free church, but it's okay. Um, so I think it's important to be just aware of the nights, you know, where God's prompting and God's present and rather than just going, well, this is where we finish the service, so we're finishing the service. Just being, having that element of spontaneity is important. But I think Robert's point as well is important as well. When we come to worship, it's not necessarily just about me and how I feel and how I want to do it. The Bible gives us a a perspective of other-centeredness. You know, Paul, for example, I would gladly restrict my freedom for the benefit of others. And so it's about the collective as well. Not all the responses we see in Scripture are necessarily in the context of of gathered worship. Um, And as Corinthians speaks about, you know, when you come together for there to be order, in the way things are done. So it's about that kind of balance as well, because I'm sure we've all had or seen or been in a situation where it's quite chaotic and distracting and taking us away from the Lord. So I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. I grew up, similar to Brian, maybe Brian can relate to this. You're in church, you sat rigidly in rows. There wasn't a, a sound apart from the occasional pan drop hitting the floor. As a kid, if you made a noise, you got the elbow in your ribs and the look that said you're in trouble when you got home. And there was just not a movement and I feel that's too restrictive. Hmm. So I think there is, there's got to be a place for spontaneity and responding to God. Because as Brian said, we're not just learning about God. We're not just singing about God. We're hearing from God. He's speaking to us, and we're singing to Him. And we're also singing to one another. I suppose that's the other thing about worship. Loads of the Psalms, for example, you're not just singing them to God. You're, oh, Israel, put your trust in God. Who are you talking to? The rest of the people gathered. And there's... there's various hymns and psalms that remind us that we're singing to one another as we gather together as well. We're encouraging each other in our faith to, to worship the Lord, to stay, to stay focused, to keep encouraged. So there's that dimension to it as well. I think if I, sorry, can I um, finish with one last story? And I realize that now I'm being a bit more um, experiential in my answers, and that's, that's fine. It I doesn't matter, I guess. But um, I remember actually going back to clan and the first clan gathering that I was part of in 2011, I think. And I was part of the youth team, and uh, Steph McLeod, the singer-songwriter, uh, came to lead worship. And you know, Steph McLeod's a big guy, right, <laughs> Steph? And uh, he's from a, you know, a background, he was a drug addict, ho- homeless, and he's, he's a remarkable musician. And he came to lead worship for the, about three, 400 young people um, uh, one evening. 
and they were all quite kind of restless. And uh, Steph, you know, he loves the Lord, and he lives in the feet of the Lord. And uh, he came up, and um, the guy who was leading the clan at that time, Ollie, he had just found out five minutes beforehand that Steph had never led corporate worship, and he was starting to freak out a bit. Oh, Steph's never led, actually. Cop. I said, no, it's okay, it's okay. We, we kind of reasoned. I said, it'd be fine. He'd be great. Steph's got a, a real sense of flow, and he, and he knows you know, how, to, how to lead these things. He'll be grand. Uh, and Steph got up to the microphone, and all these kind of teenagers going a bit, oh, you know. And he went up to the mic, he went, right, shut it, the lot of yes. <laughs> and he goes, let's pray. <laughs> and he prayed. And then by the end of the night, he had, us, he had the whole of them in a, in a hoedown singing Amazing Grace. And they were all jumping up and down singing Amazing Grace. And I think, oh, this is, it was the best rendition of Amazing Grace. And it was a real sense of, you know, godly joy uh, as well as reverential fear. And as I want to say, it's that balance of keeping, you know, the two in, 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 yeah, in order with one another. Yeah, a great night. Never forget it. Shut it. <laughs> there you go. Get your stentons for Sunday. Oh, Mike. Mike. I'm not disagreeing with anything you said, guys, but I appreciate it. But just coincidentally, or God incidentally, this morning on Radio 4, uh, there's a service there at the 10 past 8 in the morning. I, it can be from Ireland, it can be from Wales. Uh, this morning it was from London. And it was obviously a Pentecostal church of probably a Caribbean original background culture and uh, I could just visualize them doing exactly the kind of thing of what you're talking about this evening of they were dancing and clapping and singing and as you see it's their culture it's part of my culture too actually although I'm from the Highlands because I've experienced that in our church background as well and yes you know we can't be a bit restricted too restricted and pews don't help guys I think we'll all agree with that. that is true. You, you, you reminded me there a few years ago we went on a mission trip to Kenya. We arrived on the Saturday first. So the first full day was a Sunday. They insist you wore suit and tie to church, which you can imagine the 30 degree plus heat for a ginger Scotsman. It was just torture. And, you know, they'd spend all day there. You know, there was an hour or so of praise. Then they'd have a 40 minute teaching sermon, this is how we live as Christians, they'd have another slot of praise, then they'd have another 40-minute gospel sermon, which was an evangelistic sermon aimed at those. So we're looking at our watch after an hour, but this was going on, there was the middle slot, I'd done the teaching sermon, we came to the middle slot, and then this conga sparked up, and bear in mind, African culture, first day, it's just full on, hits you in the face, this conga line starts going around the church, and before long, there's just myself and the other Scottish minister, Roddy Barvis who's up at Helmsdale. Two of us are sitting there, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and I'm going, don't you dare move. And he's like, don't you dare move. <laughs> By the end, we were conga with the best of them, but that was the first day. So we're getting hoedowns this Sunday and conga lines. Looking forward to it. Right, we'll be a bit dangerous. Oh, Ian McClay. Yes, sir. Fred this morning told us that the biggest growing churches in the UK uh, African and Nigerian. Hmm. Yeah. Do they sit in their bums all the time? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. The, the Pentecostal uh, brethren of Nigerian and African. Right, let's be a bit dangerous. Any questions from the floor? Who am I going to pick up? Mr. Lev. I wanted to ask a last question. Uh, yes, sure. The thought of the conversion of the went through my mind. Correct uh, hmm. if I'm wrong. I think it mentions that even if say, a person asks you or me you know, for advice about the faith or what you have to do, that kind of thing, mm. uh, that can be considered illegal. Maybe somebody else, that's shocking, I read that. That number was not wrote before it was in the newspaper. So I, I just thought this is a way over the top. Somebody comes and asks a minister or Christian about the faith, because they're interested in mm. it. Why can that be illegal? Well, not be asking the questions illegal, so if you then take them on board and start talking to them, could it consider conversion then? So to summarise, if I get David right, he's saying that in context to the conversion therapy, 
if someone comes and asks a minister or a member of a church, there, there could be ramifications um, to our, our responses uh, to them uh, in that regard. How do we handle that? Um, interesting, and I didn't know this until yesterday, Fred was actually saying that in, in, in regard to that context, the, the religious beliefs and freedoms are better enshrined in Westminster law than they are in the Scottish Parliament law, um, which is a, a, that's a, an interesting observation that, you know, they have taken it in, in England the context of, you know, religious beliefs and churches and, and, and faith-based organizations, where in Scotland that has not yet happened or may not happen. Um, and it, it's going to be a challenge because as, 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 for me personally, I think as culture and society changes, this is going to become more of the norm, um, you know, it was put in an interesting way. We're not persecuted yet, but we're pressured. Uh, we, we are being pressured. Um, but we as Christians are called to be bold. We're called to be bold in our faith. We're called to be bold in our proclamation of the gospel. We are called to be bold in our testimony. Um, and for some of us, that means this is where the rubber hits the road. You know, I stand here every Sunday it goes out in camera. Now, a couple of years ago, Pastor McConnell from White Whirl Tabernacle in Northern Ireland uh, got pulled up uh, before the High Court in Belfast regarding uh, preaching uh, and, and saying things uh, about a certain faith group. Uh, and he, he had to go to court. Um, the court said he was unwise in what he said, but he did not, um, you know, break any laws in doing that. The reality is every Sunday morning as we give a message, we are held, will it be in person, somebody walking in off the street could take offense, somebody watching online could take offense, somebody could take offense tonight that there's four guys at the front who are all gospel preaching, uh, believing ministers sharing about faith, and we could be pulled up on that. And as a, for me, I think it's where the rubber meets the road. If you call yourself a Christian and you know there's going to be persecution and you know there's going to be pressure for your faith, are you willing to stand for that faith? Um, and that's going to come more and more, um, you know. And for me, it's a boldness. It, 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 for me, it's what I've been called to do. You know, I, I live my life by Micah 6. He, he has shown you, oh man, what is good and what does look, the Lord require for you to act justly, to love and mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And, and in that, there is a boldness. You know, love those who persecute you. You know, love those who say all evil and do evil things against you. You know, show grace, show forgiveness, show mercy. By the actions of their love, they will know that you are a, a, one of Christ's. Um, you know, it, it, it's a challenge. Um, there's no two roads about it. You know, you write a piece of your sermon, you go, hmm, do I really want to say that? You know, am I going to be that bold and to say that? And, you know, you maybe scribble it out and, and change it to a more... PC or a more, you know, culturally adapt sentence. Um, but, you know, if we say the word sin, nowadays, you know, we could be pulled up because, you know, it, it could be seen as a hate crime, telling people they're wrong. Uh, you know, um, it, it, it's difficult. There's no two roads about it. Again, I think it goes back to New Testament times. It's not new. Hmm. You know, we were looking at the church in Thessalonica tonight. Opposition gets stirred up against them. These guys are saying there's an, another king. They're following a new king who's not Caesar. And that brought them into conflict with the authorities. The Apostle Paul was brought into conflict with magistrates and authorities. Whether rightly or wrongly, uh, it, it happened. So the New Testament church flourished under these kind of circumstances. So it's, in a sense, it's not new. It's going, maybe going back perhaps more to the world of the New Testament than the world we grew up in. The challenge for us as the church is it's been comfortable to be a Christian for decades, for generations. Now it's not. And that's where the, the real challenge is, is coming up. You know, in Acts, it always strikes me that they didn't pray for the persecution to stop. They prayed for boldness in the face of it. And that, that always jars me. I'd be praying, Lord, get this to stop. <laughs> this, is, this is too hard. Please just bring an end to this. But that's, they just prayed for boldness to keep on worshiping the Lord, following the Lord, and pre preaching Christ in the face of that persecution. 
You know, I think as ministers, all we can do is continue to teach the truth as we find it in the Bible, God's word. This is what we believe. If we're not teaching that, then we're kind of going away from what we've, we've learned, what we've been following all our lives. And if we do that, we're compromising our faith. And the, the question is, do we want to compromise our faith or do we want to be truthful to God and follow what he calls us to do? And it, as the guys have said, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. And yet we're promised in um, the New Testament that the Holy Spirit will give us the right words to say. And so we just need to go out in, in grace and love and speak to people. And if they take offense, then they take offense and there'll be consequences that we have to face. But we also need to be bold, as the guys are saying, and just yeah. declare the truth as we find it in the Bible. Even when that jars with culture, we need to be preaching that faith and saying, this is what God tells, this is what Jesus says. God designed us in the first place. He knows what's best for us. And we can listen to the ways of the world, but are they any better than God's ways, really? Or are they going to hurt us in the long run if we try and follow those ways? Mm. And yes, that means, as we see many in the Bible, end up in jail or in courthouses. We've been looking at Acts and, 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 and Ross Keen for the last couple of years, and we've seen how Paul gets taken to court many times. He gets beaten and persecuted and punished. And yet, so often when he's in that courtroom, he's about to open his mouth and someone else speaks on his behalf. Or, or the Spirit gives him the right words to say. And so we have to trust that God is going to bless us with the right words to say at the right time to bless others and to offer grace and love and point them towards Jesus in everything we do. I think that's... That's really great points uh, from all you guys. And uh, the only thing I would add uh, really is yeah, as, as, uh, as Christians and, and, and right throughout the Bible, the, the people of God have always been called to be distinct. And I uh, sometimes think that there's often a, an, an overlooked teaching within the Bible that is that of, um, of the spiritual rewards that we'll get when we get to heaven, you know? Uh, and I just kind of try to hold on to that every now and again. Like, actually, yeah, we are going to get rewarded. And, uh, you know, I think it's a great blessing, imagine, to hear that from the Lord when... Uh, we meet him uh, that, on that glorious day, that yeah. great and glorious day, and say, yeah, you've done well. You stood, and uh, you, you held fast. And, yeah, I just think that's going to be an amazing day. And, you know, hold on to that as well. Um, just encouragement. I see that picture in Revelation of um, the martyrs, those who've, who'd lost their lives in persecution, in heaven, yeah. saying, how long, Lord? Yeah. How long till you come back and bring justice on the earth? Uh, they'd faced that persecution. They'd been faithful even to death. But even now in heaven, that anticipating Jesus coming back for that full reward, that inheritance, that new creation that is to come. Amazing. Hmm. We'll go another one. Any other questions from the <coughs> floor? <coughs> okay, well, I've uh, another one here that um, I'll pull on, and that is... How should the churches in all nests celebrate the king's coronation? Oh, sorry, I'm not, oh. we weren't going to sing the national anthem there. Oh, sorry. You, you, you <laughs> just had like you were about to. <laughs> You're doing the national anthem. I've heard him a few times. Yeah, no, well, I, I, I think, you know, there, there, there is a. It's a, not a gospel opportunity, as always, with any of these sort of, you know, uh, national events, with the death of the Queen, with the, the late Queen, uh, with the, the vigils uh, that were held up and down the country, uh, and the same will be the coronation uh, weekend. You know, it, it's a go, uh, you know, it's a gospel opportunity. Yes, we are, we are celebrating a, a, an earthly king being uh, coronated uh, uh, as, as uh, the earthly ruler of this uh, country in which we live, but you know there's an eternal king, and an eternal kingdom yet to come, uh, and so you, there, there's a, a gospel opportunity there to to show relevance uh, uh, to that. You know, um, you, you know we we are called to pray for those in, in leadership uh, and those who are in authority over us. Um, and, and I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity for the, for the church, um, whether that be a, a state-related church or a non-state-related church, uh, to, to say, you know, we, we celebrated, you know, 70 years of, of faithful service and Christian witness uh, in our late majesty. You know, there, 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 there is questions whether to 
King Charles's uh, agreement is the same. Um, you know, I don't know the man's heart. I, I'm not his pastor. I'm not his, you know, um, but we pray that as he takes up the role as the, the, you know, the head of the Church of England, that he has some type of Christian faith in doing so, um, that as he lives that, uh, in that role and that responsibility and, you know, ordained by God to be in that position that, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we hope and pray that his life and his witness and his testimony would live uh, out uh, the kingdom's realities uh, in, in all that he does and say. Um, you know, but I, as I say, I think there's always opportunities in, in these worldly um, uh, and, and cultural uh, uh, opportunities to, to be able to share the, the hope and the reality of the eternal king um, as best we can as churches. It's got on. There we go. I all looked at them and they're looking at me going, you've answered it. <laughs> um, so, Callum, I'm going to give you this one. How old do you think the earth is? That is since God created it. Oh, I was hoping you'd give me this one. Okay, I, I love Genesis. We've just preached through Genesis. So, have I got 45 minutes to answer this? <laughs> um, in all honesty, I don't think the Bible's really vaguely interested in answering that question. Uh, um, you know, Genesis 1, God has just rescued the people from, from Egypt. He's taken them out of slavery. He set them free. The first thing he does is not sit them down for a geology lesson. Genesis 1, there's a, there's a specific point, I think, to Genesis 1. I'll throw a question back at you. What did God create? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the earth. What is that? What do you visualize? I don't even know what I visualize when I think of that. The earth was without form and void. Tohu wabohu. It's the one thing I remember from Hebrew lessons. Not tofu, but tohu wabohu. Formless and empty. So what did God create? What did that look like? It's a bit of a mystery, and it's just there. It appears in verse 1. It's just there. Um, so the point of Genesis 1 is actually something... I think it's really beautiful. You've got seven days of creation. The first six are actually three pairs. Is that right? Yes, three pairs. Get my maths right. You know, the first three days he creates, the second three days he fills it. You know, for example, he creates the, separates the land and the sea. He fills the land. He fills the seas. He fills the air. And it's like a pyramid building up. The one day on its own is the Sabbath day, the day of rest. That's the point of Genesis 1. So you can imagine you're a people who have been worked as slaves for 400 years in Egypt by the God, Pharaoh. What is God revealing to you in Genesis 1? Who's working? God is. And what's God working to do? Give his people rest, to make this beautiful world, to put the people that he has made, that they can enjoy him and rest forever. You can imagine how that's music to the ears of an Israelite. We've been worked as slaves building these cities, and now God is going to provide for us rest? That's beautiful. And I think that's what Genesis 1 is actually communicating, not how old the earth is. So there's lots of different opinions. Personally, I lean towards an old earth rather than a young earth. I think there's lots of things in the Bible text that would prompt that. Genesis 1 itself, the seventh, is that Genesis 2? The seventh day is never said to have ended. It was evening and morning, first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. Never says that about the seventh day. I think that's quite an interesting we omission in the text. Is God still, I think the implication is God still rests from his work of creation even now. The seventh day is ongoing. So there's, there's indications there. It's not as straightforward as we might think. So anyway, we sermon on Genesis 1, complete. Brilliant. Any of you two want to add in? Coming from a geography degree, I'm very oh, much I'm scientific. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm very much on the, I kind of was brought up with a scientific understanding of how old the earth is and to be honest I've never really kind of given it a grand deal of thought because for me again the age of the earth isn't really that important the thing that's always been important to me in any of these arguments is God created the world mm. and that's where I've always kind of do you know what we could we could agree or disagree on how old the earth is and we may never agree and have to dis agree to disagree on that matter the fundamental issue that I want to stick to is that God created the world 
whether it's millions of years old or thousands of years old, depending on your viewpoint, I don't mind which that is because I don't think there's a theological em emphasis on that particularly. Mm -hmm. I think it's more God created the world. Yeah. And that's where I've always kind of stuck my colors on that one. So. Yeah, he made it. He made it good and we uh, messed it up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Well, given that we've, we've talked about Sabbath ever so slightly, one of the, the questions that was submitted is, should Christians observe a digital Sabbath, given that we are now in a, in a culture where uh, tablet, 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 no Paper. pad, <laughs> rest your case. Um, you know, we, we, we are on our phones, we are, we are watching, you know, Netflix and Amazon Prime, we're watching uh, uh, TV coming out our ears, we're, we're hooked to listening to podcasts and, and everything. We're now digitally live streaming church services. Um, you know, is, is there a stronger emphasis maybe needed for the sense of, of a digital Sabbath? You're looking at me, but I think I'm it's very dangerous to ask ministers about a Sabbath day because we're a bunch of hypocrites. Because we're great at getting up there and preaching the importance of a Sabbath, but we don't take one. <laughs> Ministers are the worst at not taking days off, so I firmly confess my hypocrisy right at the start. I think, I think it's just wise in general to, to set safeguards and perhaps limits. Or, you know, I've tried. I don't say I succeed all the time, but even things like don't check emails after 7 o'clock at night. If it's that urgent, they'd phone. If we can wait till 9 o'clock in the morning, we don't need to be on 24-7. So we can set kind of healthy boundaries in our life in terms of digital. In terms of a Sabbath day, I think it's a wisdom issue. I would say a Sabbath day is a day that's different. A holiday, it's a holy day. It's a day that's different from all the others. So what that looks like, what will that look like for you might be different to what it looks like for me. But it is to be a day that's different. So I think it benefit all of us, not necessarily a Sabbath a week, but even in our regular holidays or different things, leave the phone at home, go out for the day without the phone, not check our emails. I discover that the world doesn't end if I don't check my emails hmm. or if I'm not available at the end of a phone 24-7. You know. <laughs> I remember the days, I used to go out as a kid and not come back, it'll go dark in the afternoon. <laughs> but yeah. days before you're available, I think it does help um, to take a break from all these things now and again. I thought it was a really interesting question, actually, because some people, we spend so much time on these small boxes that are in our phones or in our pockets, and they can take our whole focus so easily. There's another question in there about watching reels and things. I was thinking, well, there's nothing bad about watching reels, so to speak, but if they suddenly start taking you over your whole day and you're watching them for half an hour, an hour, or longer at a time, then is that helpful for you? Or if you're kind of going on to the internet to read the news and you're getting yourself depressed and down and kind of just not being able to look forward to things in life because everything seems to be dark and dingy and horrible out there in the world, then taking a digital Sabbath makes sense or at least some time away from your phone so that you're not constantly being, being bombarded with bad news so you can give your focus to something else. Um, I was thinking kind of like if I was, if I'm looking at my phone is what I'm looking at, if, if Jesus is kind of is, is here with me right now, kind of watching it with me, is he going to be happy about it? It's kind of, you know, that bracelet used to get, what would Jesus do? So, or in this case, I was thinking, what would Jesus think about me watching that on my phone or on the computer, on the, the screen? What would he think about me watching that program or that reel? Or, and if I think, well, you know what, I don't think he'd be too happy about that, then that's a good sounding board for perhaps mm. I shouldn't be watching it. And perhaps I need to take a break from my phone for a bit. I think. It's really good points uh, that you guys make. And um, yeah, I think when COVID came, a lot of us were readjusting perhaps lifestyles and, you know, how we were going to um, arrange our day perhaps or when we were going to go outside for our, for our exercise and, you know, do all that sort of thing. Um, I think at that time, I, I remember a book came out, which I've actually brought with me this evening, which I was quite influenced by. It's by a guy called John Mark Comer called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, how to, stay, how to Stay Emotionally Healthy and Spiritually Alive in the Chaos of the Modern World. And it's a really good book. And one of the chapters on it is, uh, speaks of Sabbath. And he's quite influenced by the Christian philosopher uh, Dallas Willard. 
Um, but, but he goes on to kind of develop the chapter of Sabbath to, to digital Sabbath and how he says that it, it's, it's really important to take a digital Sabbath. So I think in the time of COVID, I started um, periodically from time to time taking a digital Sabbath and be a bit more aware of the phone and its dangers and in terms of you know, spending too much time on it and you go to bed and your, your eyes are kind of, you know, I can't get to sleep or, or you know, it's taking a while to get to sleep and recognizing these things. I think now that we're coming out of COVID, um, I must say that I've forgotten some of that and been challenged to, to go back to that and realizing, yeah, I, I do, of course, spend too much time on my phone. Um, it, it's just there. It's there in the morning, first thing. It's there late at night. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's everywhere. Um, and I read a story of this uh, Christian writer. He, he used to be the editor of Christianity T Today, Andy Crouch. And so he, he decided to take 40 days offline, no screens, no social media. And his description of the experience was, he said it was most delightful. He said, but he admitted that there was this thing that's described as FOMO, the fear of missing out. He says, it's a real thing. What I was most afraid of was missing out on not information, but affirmation. I discovered how attached or maybe addicted I was to the small daily dose of reassurance that other people would like me, follow me. It was sobering how strong the pull was on me. And um, I th felt like I can really resonate with that because, you know, when you find that you don't, you go offline for a little bit and you come online again, you think, oh, I'm, uh, I've really missed out on something or you know, these uh, Christian influencers there and, you know, what, what, you know what, I'm not being invited to the party or whatever. Um, but, but, yeah, I think in some, I, I um, would like to say that I wish I could uh, be more uh, digitally uh, Sabbath-oriented and uh, I think, I've, yeah, I would be very much challenged by that uh, mm -hmm. in this question, for sure. Yeah. I think even just practically it's so good, but how many times maybe just getting ready for bed and an email comes in that stresses you out and you're lying there at night thinking about this email and what you're going to say and, oh, I'm going to have to sort this out in the morning and it just can ruin your night's sleep. And so I think just having these boundaries and observing Sabbaths is it's just really helpful yeah. for our whole well-being. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to add anything because I've said it all. I was going yeah. to say, though, if, if it's your way of connecting with Jesus, if that's the only place you've got your Bible, then... <clears throat> Keep reading your Bible on your phone, but if it's replacing Jesus in your life, then that's a good time to say, actually, you know what, I need to put it down and put Jesus back in the focus again. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Right, let me ask you three a question. <laughs> Great being the host. Um, you know, the four of us and others in the room who are in ministry have just came through probably the biggest generational thing that we will probably ever encounter in the, in the pandemic. Um, you know, we were never taught Zoom 101 in our theology classes. We were never taught live stream uh, etiquette or, you know, how, how, how to do ministry in a wee square box. Mm -hmm. um, but as, as we, as churches come out of the pandemic, we, we notice that not everybody's coming back to church. Not everybody's being involved in church as maybe they were before. Um, what do you think the biggest challenge that faces our, our ministries and our churches as, as we try to reestablish what church is and, and how we reach the community? Should have started that at the beginning, shouldn't I? <laughs> I think Fred Drummond said something quite interesting on that yesterday in the sense of people are looking for community and yet for many churches one hour on a Sunday and then that's it, they're not back again and we're looking to, so one of the things we need to be looking at is ways that we can engage with one another where that's saying, do you want to come around for a cup of coffee? Come around to the house and then not just chatting about the football or the weather but actually going, can I pray for you? What, what's going on in your life right now? What's really going on in your life right now? And learning to engage again with one another and face-to-face, -face, because it's something we've got out of the habit of with COVID and with technology in our pockets and sort of just these drops on our message, and we've got kind of out of the habit of face-to-face -face chat. And, and so one of those things was that that engaged, really challenged me yesterday from Fred was kind of this idea of engaging kind of neighbor to neighbor, or when was the last time you invited your neighbor around for coffee or for lunch or dinner, and, and then sort of praying with them, or he was talking about someone else that he knew who, whenever he went to a restaurant, would sort of 
when the waiter came with the food, just say, did you mind holding? Because like, we're Christians, we want to pray for our food, but also, can we pray for you as well as you're serving us? And thank you for your service. And is there anything we can be praying for in your life specifically? And that was a real challenge mm. to think about, well, how are we engaging us? What difference are we actually making? If we're just there on Sunday morning, is that making a difference in the community's life? What can we be doing to reach out and actually help people in the community that is going to actually make them think and look up and sit up and go, do you know what? There's something different about them that mm. makes me want to learn some more about it. Yeah. I think the next decade for the church is absolutely crucial and critical. And if we don't radically change, there'd be huge, huge challenges ahead. At the same time, there's also, I think, a longing in people's hearts to return to the ancient paths. Mm. And that's why I think um, organizations like 24-7 Prayer, and we've been doing the prayer course in our evening services, uh, have been really popular because... They've been doing courses which uh, really go back to like the the ancient kind of Celtic ways or the um, yeah that, that sort of style, uh, ancient ways of praying like the the lectio divina, um, but but in a kind of evangelical modern context, and so taking these two things together where you've got a um, patterns of living, um, you know, I remember thinking of. Brother Lawrence is being the, described himself as the Lord of the pots and pans, praying as he washed the dishes, doing his day-to-day -day life, uh, living in, in community, uh, communal life, uh, and viewing the whole of Christian life, uh, you know, like the Romans 12, just uh, living our whole lives for Christ as a living sacrifice, that which is, which is, which is pleasing and acceptable to the Lord um, as our offering of worship. Um, so taking that, kind of going back to the ancient paths, but also seeing what could church be um, where, where there's a two or at least generation gap of, of folks who are not at church and, uh, you know, holding on to our pews or our, our style of music or our traditions for, for maybe too long and saying, well, you know, what are we going to do? That's the question we're asking at the moment. What are we going to do to reach the next generation? Uh, how do we meet them where, where they're at and uh, see that Jesus is the fulfillment of the longing of every human heart that, and that God has placed eternity in the human heart and how do we reach folk where they're at? Um, but also be open as a church to where he's uh, uh, leading us and looking at the lovely chairs that you have here in Allen's Baptist Church and the folks who are uh, here from Invergordon Church this evening, that's just looking to our future. <laughs> so very nice <laughs> chairs. And <laughs> there you go. Question at the back. Do you feel that there is a place for one church Well, well I'm, I'm, going to get, I'm going to give the answer and let these three debate it out, right? Uh, in this, there is only one denomination actually mentioned in Scripture, and he was the cousin of Jesus himself, John the Baptist. Uh, wasn't John the Presbyterian? Don't see the Pentecostals, I see a Baptist. Take from that what you want, okay? Now I'll hand it over to my three brethren. I think, I think there's no denying that older denominations and institutions are, are, are um, in, the, in the steep decline yeah. and that um, independent churches, whether, whether that be an independent evangelical church, whether that be a newer denomination from post-1900 like the Elam Pentecostal yeah. Church or the Redeemed Christian Church of God, the Pentecostal Church again, which is you know, the fastest growing church in the UK. Um, Fred shared that with us this morning. Um, yeah, it's certainly there's a, a change in the dynamic in terms of denominationalism. You know, uh, for me, it doesn't matter so much, no. I mean, we're, if we're all one in Christ and we all believe the same thing on, on the, the, the primary issues, you know, uh, Christ's atoning sacrifice and uh, the authority of the Bible and, you know, these kind of main core points, there's, there's more you know, kind of what does it mean to be an evangelical. Fred shared that over the weekend as well. And if we share these core values, then, hey, that's, that's all good. Yeah, I once heard an illustration is that denominations are are okay as long as we don't build these big walls up between one another. As long as the walls are big enough, we can step over. You know, again, in the early church, there was the church singular in Rome, in Ephesus, but they didn't necessarily all meet in one place. Hmm. There would have been smaller gatherings of them all around the city, but they were one in Christ. Hmm. And I think that's the goal. And I think it's one of the great things living here is the, the unity amongst the different denominations and the churches, the shared work and outreach that we do try and and live out that oneness as best we can. Um, you'd hear stories in the Western Isles in the revival time, you know, folks from the different denominations 
fellowshipping together in their homes, walking to church, and they may have gone into different church buildings, some right beside each other, hmm. and then they come back out and they're worshiping together again and fellowshipping. There was that unity, though they might have been in a different building on a Sunday morning. So, you know, division can, can easily creep in and become a sinful thing, hmm. but, it, you know, I think it can be a positive thing with all our differences. Celebrate those differences and still be one. Yeah. You, know, I, you know, for me, I was baptized a Roman Catholic, got saved in the Berlin Church, grew up in the Presbyterian Church, and I'm now a Baptist minister. No, well, Which church did you yeah. go to that Well, I think that, I, you know, it, it comes, uh, as Isabel says, it comes to Revelation. From each tribe and tongue and nation, we will be gathered, but we will be one in Christ Jesus. Mr. Steinke. Well, there is a way around it, of course. You can all become Baptists. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I grew up in Church of Scotland, actually, as a Presbyterian, and I was going to ask you a question, but you could have said it there the day before that. But uh, I grew up in, in my 30s, I saw the light and became a Baptist, and I was going to ask a Presbyterian minister if you might see the light and come and join us. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all taken away there, so. I'm going to say back to Robert, there was one John the Baptist, but there's many elders in the New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> Many presbyters. <laughs> That's very true. Um, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, as has already been highlighted, you know, I, I, I think our differences are, are few enough between us that we work well together to show a united front. You know, we, we meet, now meet monthly as churches in this area to join together for prayer together uh, once uh, a month on a Saturday morning um, because we see the unity of that. We, we do our... Uh, Good Friday service together as joint churches because, you know, we hold all together central to the, the crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we, we work well together in that sense of, you know, I, I jokingly joke with these guys and they do as much with me. You know, the, the, literally the difference between the four of us sitting up here is I believe in believers' baptism and they sprinkle babies. Uh, that, that, that's the, how it comes down to theology-wise in our understanding of theology, you know, but we would agree fundamentally the same on the gospel truth and what it means to be gospel ministers and what it means to proclaim that good news of Jesus. And in that, there is no difference, you know, in that calling as ministers of gospel and as churches, as we teach our congregations, there is no difference. We are teaching them to go and make disciples. Um, you know, I, and, you know, I, th I think, you know, that's the fundamental reality. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what signs above the door. Um, but we'll see you all here next Sunday. Sorry? The chairs. I am very aware, I'm very aware of some because of the chairs. Um, is there any other questions from the floor? Take the chairs home with you on the way, mate. <laughs> I have a major problem regarding, you know, the Church of Scotland, regarding the General Assembly. I feel that Satan is taking over the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. Not, not the people, on the people, but, you know, General Assembly is really, it's not God. You can see the things that are happening there, that, you know, and I just wonder how you manage to deal with it. Well, as a Baptist, I only look outside watching in and, and pray for him, but for, you know, I, I would hand over to these two who are in the midst of it. Yeah, Brian and Phil. I was just had a terrible experience with a lady called Kerry. The Kerry wasn't living the right life. She was living, uh, as far as I was concerned, she was living a wrong life. But she needed help, and I wanted to help her. But I didn't feel it was my place to preach her, you know. But then, two days later, I discovered she committed suicide. And the thing is, if I'd told her and really preached her, you know, and I thought it was her commitment, you know, it's our duty. If we love people, and if we love people, no matter what their uh, gender is or anything, if we love them, we need to warn them and we need to tell them. And we can't really accept, you know, what's um, going on in the General Assembly. You know, in the Church of Scotland, and uh, you know, you know, I really feel this is uh, not many of you. <laughs> no, I think there's this.
people here have experienced more wounds uh, over the years in, in general assemblies than, than ourselves, you know, just thinking of Andy being here as well. And, you know, and, and it grieves our hearts for, for sure, absolutely. I think just being careful of our, of our language, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, of course, there, there is a, an aspect where, where you know, um, there, there's not a lot of good, there's not good things and not good decisions being made. And, of course, that's particularly within the area of sexuality and, and uh, Phil uh, spoke really bravely and, and, and brilliantly last year at the General Assembly um, uh, about that. And, and, yeah, we do need more voices like that, um, speaking, you know, crazily to truth. Um, yeah, Phil, do you want to speak into that just a bit more? And, you know? well, I think, in the sense of that one, yeah. specifically, that with culture around us speaking the way it does, it is incredibly hard for us to remain faithful to what Christ calls. And it's so easy for us to get into that way of thinking, that mindset. And so one of the challenges is constantly just trying to preach the truth as we find it in the gospel, doing it with grace and with love and with care. And, and that will keep some people kind of following the same ways, but some people are going to sort of lose that sight, lose sight of that and of what the Bible teaches in those senses. And that's what we saw at General Assembly, that unfortunately many have kind of gone away from what we believe the Bible is teaching us and have interpreted it differently to fit their, what they're seeing around in culture rather than taking the Bible and taking the truth from that to culture. So it makes it incredibly difficult to live with. And what we can do is we can pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We can support each other as mm. we're in here. We support each other wonderfully. We, we meet monthly as ministers just to support each other and pray and pray for the church in general. Mm. because decisions like this have happened we see them in in revelation you speak, see people talking about well that church there kind of has woe to you because you've not followed christ the way you were supposed to follow christ and and all of us are are broken guilty people who are unable to follow the, the guidelines of the laws that god set out mm. and that's where we need christ's grace and we fall back on that all the time we're not Thankfully, we don't have to do it ourselves. We fall back on Christ who has done it for us. Mm. And that's what we have to keep on remembering and teaching each other is that we can't do this ourselves. We're broken individuals, each and every one of us. None of us here are perfect. And yet we're called to love each other. Even if we disagree with what other people are saying. So it's a sense of within the General Assembly, we need to be more loving and careful in the way we speak to one another. We need to be teaching the truth and when we see people saying something we disagree with we need to be saying look as it says in the bible you go to the individual first and you speak to them and then if they're not listening you, you maybe get a couple together and you speak to them with two and if that's not working you speak as a church to them can i just add to that so you're no, you're um yeah just trying to get my thoughts clear there um i i absolutely love the church of scotland i do I love the Church of Scotland, and I've been called to the Church of Scotland. I've not been called to the Free Church or the Baptist Church. I've been called to the Church of Scotland, so has Phil. Uh, and it is a calling. Um, and it is a difficult time to be part of the Church of Scotland, um, nationally speaking. Um, it is a broad church. I've just been part of my first uh, s committee within the Church of Scotland. It's a uh, supplementary hymn book thing. And I've just about to come off it, to be honest, because there's discussions about uh, how they have issues with singing words like men and women of the faith and, uh, you know, LGBTQ uh, inclusion in the songs. That's been a lot of discussion about that. Uh, and I very much feel like a minority voice. And I'm not trying to get my violin out saying, oh, woe is me. But, but it is saying, you know, I've, I've been called here because I love the Church of Scotland, because my experience of the Church of Scotland has been really positive. I came through a church which was really vibrant and growing. Um, at the time I went forward for ministry, there were five other guys um, in that church in, in Stornoway. At the same time, when I was part of that same um, a church in Edinburgh, Holy Trinity, there was also five other guys being called for ministry. And, and, and I've been part of a, a church Scotland that have, that have grown and have been vibrant when I went into the training process and I saw that that wasn't always the experience of others. Mm -hmm. And I met candidates who were perhaps a bit more liberal in their theology uh, what can you do but, but, but just love them and, and, and listen to them, but also challenge when, when it's necessary and ask the Lord for discernment when, when's the right time to do that. Um, and I'm just thankful for folks who have gone before us, like Andy and Mike and, 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 and Ian and, and many others um, sitting here and, and to glean upon their wisdom. 
uh, um, and also just to, uh, you know, it, saying that it is a difficult time to be a minister in the church school and to be a young minister, um, you know, and, and we need all the encouragement we, we can get. And I'm thankful for the folks in Invergordon for their encouragement. Mm. Uh, but we do, we, do, we, we do need all the encouragement that we can get. And I think the spiritual gift of encouragement needs to be recovered in the church in our day so that we can flourish as, as God's people and, and speak uh, truth, uh, but also do with grace and, and love. Yeah. Oh, thank you for your answers to that, guys. The last question, um, and I, I think it's an important question that we, we should answer is, what can and should the church do in the, the growing public mental health crisis as, as we look around, you know, even in this area, we, we, we know it's, it's rife within our towns of, of Allness and Ember Garden um, and, and wider afield. Um, you know, we, we know that the pandemic has part to play in that, uh, you know, and, and all the challenges that come with that. Um, but what do you think the, the church's uh, role and responsibility and, and you know, answer to that situation should be? Um, well, it's not a full answer, but I think the primary thing we can do is, is tell them about the gospel, that they're made by God, and loved by mm. God, that, you know, the promises of Jesus, to have Jesus as your shepherd, who's there with you every moment of every day, goodness and mercy all your life. You know, we live in a society that's become disconnected from their creator. Yeah lost a sense of identity, and with the, the COVID crisis, there's maybe for the first time in many people's experience a sense of mortality. Hmm. Suddenly, pestilence stalks the land, if you go back to that. That's for us in this country, that's the first time maybe in many people's experience that they were confronted with their own mortality. There's this disease that you could catch, you can't see it, and it's potentially life-threatening. Hmm. So add that in, kind of divorced from a sense of who God is, what lies beyond this world, eternity that God has set in the heart of man. I think first and foremost, people need to know the truth that we, that we hold in, in God's Word, that you are loved, you are valued, you can have hope, you can have a sense of what goes beyond this world, and you can have a very present help in times of trouble now, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's not all the answer. No. Of course it's not, but I think yeah. that's a, an important part of it. I think in some ways just being there for them, offering a listening ear, mm. providing a space that is safe for them to come into where they know that you're not going to go out in the street and start chatting behind their back about them, just a safe place they can come, listen, that they can offload some of their issues and their worries. As you say, confirm them, remind them that they're loved, they're not alone in this world. But also at the same time, being aware that we're not the professionals in mental health, that we can't take those roles on because we've not done the training for it. And we need to be able to signpost the people to the right places to go to, saying they're this team over in Invergordon or on this or Rigmore that you can go to. They are specialists. They're trained to deal with these issues that you are struggling with, that, and they are best placed to help you. But I'll be there with you. I'll walk with you. I'll pray with you. I will listen to your worries and your fears, and yeah. I'll take you there if you need to. If you can't get there, I will help you get to the these places, I'll support you in whatever way I can, but remembering also that it's not what, the way we've been trained. We're not trained yeah. professionals in this as well. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah I think, um, of course, the mental health crisis is not, it covers all across the age spectrum, um, but I think particularly young people and, and um, young adults. And yeah, I know as part of my call here that, that you know, we really want to, spend a, a lot of time reaching uh, young people and young families, just mm. that missing generation and uh, a generation desperate for, for that identity um, and to know, as, as you said, Honda, uh, that sense of a, a, a return of the Imago Dei, that we're all made in the image of God and that we're loved and uh, beautiful in his eyes. And I uh, went into the, the school and we did an after-school drumming club and you know the numbers vary two, five, six, or whatever, you know, but I was just asking the music teacher there, I said, um, in the academy in Invergordon, I said, so uh, how are you getting on yourself? And, uh, you know, I was just saying, it's, it's hard, you know, the young people, they just, there's an identity crisis, and it's so hard, you feel for them, and and it just, you know, it breaks our hearts, isn't it? That, mm. But, but we, we, we stand in the hope of the gospel, isn't it? And, um, yeah, I think the fields are ripe for harvest, uh, but also it's, it's going to be a long slog ahead, too, 
And it's just holding these things in tension where we have that gospel hope, but also uh, that, that we take that one step at a time and, and look to reach out and, and to mm. yeah, uh, meet folk where they're at. Yeah. Uh, and I, I agree with all the guys have said, you know, the, a, a part of it has to come down to understanding your self-worth and value. Um, and, I, and I think in culture and society, there has been a, a sense of, of tearing that down um, quite considerably, which has, has caused and, and has helped stimulate some of the, the issues that, that we now face. Um, you know, not a couple of years ago, I was driving home from a funeral, uh, and I was driving between um, the Skake services and the first junction uh, to turn into Allness uh, at the bottom of um, uh, Sutherland Place there. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw what I thought was a body lying at the side of the road. And y you have that instance, no, that, that, that couldn't have been what was there. But it was, uh, I stopped the car, pulled in, ran back, and there was a guy who had cut his wrists and was lying at the side of the road bleeding out. And now seven cars had been in front of me, had drove past oblivious, call it the Lord's providence, I stopped and ran back. And he had just been at his mother's funeral and he was walking from Inverness crematorium to Wick. He had had a fallout with his family um, and had had enough. He had no water, it was big and hot day and I stopped, and he says, well, why did you stop? You know, leave me alone. I, you know, I, I just want to, I'm like, buddy, number one, I'm a minister, and I ain't going to do that. Uh, you know, number two, I have a duty of care to you. Regardless who you are, you are my brother. You are an image bearer. We're going to get you fixed up. And I, I ran back to the car, and I, I reversed it down, got my first aid kit out, fixed him up, gave water, phoned the ambulance. Um, and he, he just kept going, well, why did you stop? Why, why did you do it? Why did you stop? And I said, it's because Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. You know, I put that guy in the back of the ambulance. I don't know his name, didn't find out his name, don't know what happened to him. But in that instance, in his crisis, something of God was shown in the love that was demonstrated. And we can only pray that as churches, as we engage with the community, as we engage with families, as we engage with the young people in our roles and responsibility as chaplains, is that we sow something of the love of Jesus. And we pray that that love shines brighter than what this world has to offer them, or what this world is telling them they should be, or can be, or you know, teaching them in our, our, our schools and our education settings. Um, you know, we have a tremendous privilege and responsibility as ministers being able to get into our schools. There are many places where that isn't the case. Um, you know, and, and we see it firsthand, the generation that are, are behind us uh, and the challenges they face and the culture that they're growing up in and the world that they're growing up. And all these things stem from culture and society and world. You know, I've said it before, my mother hit me with a baffy. I have no problem with that. But you wouldn't be allowed to do that today. Discipline has gone. You know, structure has gone. And when all these things fade away, when they all, you know, disappear, then we wonder why there's crises. Well, that's why there's crises, because there's no stability. There's no firm grounding and, and, and footing. You know, I, I hold nothing against what my mother did to me. It made me a better person. I knew I did something wrong, you know, and and, that, and that's a, the reality of it. But I, I you know, for us, I, I think there's a greater challenge, especially as we come out of COVID, especially, you know, we, we have seen it in this area in the last two years, the amount of issues, you know, there were, there were three young men under 40 missing, you know, all at the one time. That's not including about people I've heard at the age of 70 in Inverness committing suicide. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter what your age or stage. It is challenging and facing everybody. Uh, you know, and as Callum has said, I think it's about promoting that love, promoting that 
that image bearing uh, love that you are valued, cherished, and cared for by a king eternal who loves you. Um, you know, and, and I think that's one of the... Quick um, stories on that, Robert. Mm. Um, you know, the vacuum that we live in is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. So mm. like you're saying, when you are able to explain about the love of Jesus, it does impact. And two school assembly stories very quickly. I won't mention the school, but I was doing an assembly and this hand went up, this girl, kind of the middle, middle of primary school, P4-5, and she said, are you telling me that God came into the world because he loves me? I said, yeah. And that he died on a cross to forgive my sin so I could live forever in heaven? I went, yeah. That's pretty awesome. I was like, yes, you're right. That is pretty awesome. And that's, that's what we're here to tell you. Mm. And then just recently, I was asked by one school to do an assembly on resilience. And I remember sitting there going, resilience? What on earth am I going to say about resilience to P1 to 3? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so I was scratching my head, felt I was banging my head off a desk. But eventually what we came up with, I don't know if I can remember the five things, but there was five things. You know, you're not, you're loved. You're not on your own. Bad times don't last forever. It's okay to ask for help. You know, even Jesus in Gethsemane had to ask people to pray for him. And if you trust in Jesus, the best is yet to come. So those were the, I did remember, those were the five things. And I remember I finished the assembly, and it was just one of these God moments. Sometimes you go into school, I don't know how the other guys feel. Sometimes you feel like, is there any point in this? You, don't, you just feel like you're, you know, throwing stuff into the ether and very little comes back. But then nobody moved and nobody spoke, and you're kind of awkwardly waiting for the teachers to come back and carry on the assembly, and you think, where's everybody gone? And there were tears in their eyes. And they were going, that was beautiful. Hmm. And it, there was a, a, just a God moment where the teachers were moved, and, but it was just basic gospel truth. You're made by God. You're loved by God. You're not on your own. Bad times don't last forever, and it's okay to ask for help. And tying that into the theme of resilience, but God used that. Hmm. So as we proclaim the truth that God's given to us, you know, it's an amazing thing to be able to do that. Jackie. Have you ever had a time that you wanted to just quit? Because then you come get broken to church, the world around you is falling apart. Usually about half six every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Morning or evening? <laughs> Both. Sorry, that was the Um. Yeah, honest answer is yeah. You do have, you do have moments where, well, until the strikes, being a postie was a very appealing job for a, you know, sometimes it'd be great to have a job. You could go home and not worry about it and not be checking emails at all hours of night and all consuming. But like Brian's saying, it's a calling. And I think that's what sustains us in the hardest of times is that God has called us to this work. God has mm. called us to this place. And we remain in our stations until God calls us somewhere else. So, yeah, it, it can be hard going and it can be discouraging. And, and there are wounds that comes the way, I think, you, perhaps uniquely to ministry as well. Um, the scar tissue builds up and you toughen up over time in the years. To, but, um, yeah, so you, there is that. And I think, like Brian said earlier, a ministry of encouragement mm. is, is maybe a, a gift that we need to recapture in our churches because... I've just got, there's many communities, you know, sporting communities and other communities that are very positive, vibrant communities. And sometimes the church can become a very negative, critical community, and it should be the other way around. We should be modeling to the world what an encouraging, <coughs> vibrant, positive community looks like. And there are times we need to learn from others around us. So the honest answer is yes, but mm. God sustains you and God gives you the grace and keeps me going. But mm. These yeah. boys are younger than me in ministry, yeah. so maybe they haven't had that yet. Well, you know, I, I can share, not this Christmas past, but the Christmas before. Um, I walked around this housing estate uh, um, Christmas Eve, you know, going, is this still where I'm called to? Is this still the responsibility as the under-shepherd? You know, and, and I, I was walking around and I was shouting and I was, you know, I really wrestled, you know, um, Jim and the kids were asleep. I literally got up out of bed and, and went for a walk. Um, and, you know, the, the reality is we are human too. You know, I, I've often said it here. In a normal job, you have 
two people telling you, you know, this is your role, this is your responsibility, this is your job description. We have congregations of 40, 60, 100 people who all have different views of what a minister should be, different views of what our roles and responsibilities are, different views of what we should be doing or not doing, how we should be conducting ourselves and not conducting ourselves. And, you know, the reality is we listen to all that and we navigate a path through that with discernment and praying that God will lead us to be the better under shepherds, to lead the congregations where he has placed us and given us responsibility for care, that in doing that, we do it to his glory and his honor and his kingdom's building. But the reality is we're still human. You know, it's still a tough gig. There are still days when you're exhausted and you go home and the kids are wanting your attention, the wife's wanting your attention, you, you, you go home and there's another phone call that something else has happened and you're turning right back out and going straight back out the door. You know, as Honda says, I will admit, we are not good at taking holidays, you know, because we care, because we love, because we want to see the sheep, sheep protected and well looked after because we know the responsibility that on the last day we will have to give an account for those who we have had responsibility and care for. And so the burden in our heart is, is, is great. Um, you know, but those seasons come and go as well. Um, you know, and you know, throughout that, you, you have the good times, you have the, the, the times of, of joy and the times of happiness. You know, tomorrow I get to do a wedding from a, a couple of, from America that flew over um, and just asked me to do their wedding. And, and that's going to be a wonderful day, you know, um, you know, you, you get to rejoice with people, you know, but we do life with people. And so it is, it is an emotional um, and burdensome role, but, you know, we're called to it. That's why we do it, because we love uh, and we want to show Christ's love. Um, so, yeah. These guys have only been in less than a year. Don't know. You trying to run yet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about God, but I certainly had doubts regularly that is this really God? Do you really can I really do this, God? Are you am I not just making a right fluff of this? Right and right muck up of it. Surely you can't want me at the front talking to all these folk, trying to teach them what you want. Because mm. We doubt all the time. We doubt yeah. our abilities, kind of. And that's also a good key, because every time I have doubted, there's been something that's confirmed it. I remember going through the training and the calling at the beginning, and that sense of, really, God, me? I couldn't, like, you remember how, like, at university, I couldn't get up and speak for, and, like, two weeks beforehand, I was kind of not sleeping and not eating right, and you want me to do that every week? <laughs> I'm like, that can't be me, God. And, yeah. and yet, the more I've gone through this process, and the more I've kind of you see how God builds you up and develops you and changes you and, and you still have doubt. You go, mm. I must be making a mess of this God. You surely want me out the window and put someone else who's much better qualified than me in there. Mm. And yet every time that sort of, there's always a confirmation, whether it's you're reading your Bible and something jumps out of you, you get a phone call or someone says something that just inspires you again or mm. you read something, whether it's a, a book like Brian's got there or, or something or it's a a blog or something, or you listen to a bit of music and a lyric jumps out of you and suddenly you're encouraged <laughs> again and you've... Yeah. So. People ask me, you know, how the job's going. I say they haven't fired me yet. <laughs> that, that, that's my response. Until God moves me or this church fires me. My, my motto is preach, pray, love and stay. And, and that's a responsibility that I have. Brian, you have the final word. Um... Yeah, every day is a school day. Every day is a school day, for sure. Um, if I was being totally honest, it, when the folks, the lovely folks, called me and received the letter to Invergordon Church of Scotland from, from the committee, um, if I was to look at the profile uh, from the outset of how it looked graphically, visually, and all the rest, you know, from a very human re standpoint, I probably would have thought, nah, it's all right, you know, put it to the side and look for something a little bit more you know, visually attractive or whatever. And that's just being totally honest. But there was something about the profile which was honest and, um, you know, just something that really grabbed my heart, and that was the, the call of God 
And you know, that's what we hold on to, uh, the call of God. And yeah, just try to live, live, live healthily. Um, you know, I've, I've put on a few, few pounds since I've got here. So um, yeah, exercise, um, yeah, that, that, that includes that. But you know, just keeping close to Jesus and abiding in him. Uh, of course, we go through ups and downs because uh, we're human. We're just like anyone else, uh, as, you know, even though we have the title Rev. And, uh, but we're just called to follow Jesus, simply as that, and keep our eyes fixed on him, and, and, and he'll do the rest, and he'll keep working in and through us. And yeah, it's good. And yeah, as I say, I think it just comes back to encouragement. Yeah, I think, I, I just think, yeah, above all else, to, to encourage one another. Um, and share our burdens with one another. Galatians 2, 6 2 says, yeah. yeah. As Phil says, I was reminded, God doesn't call the qualified, He qualifies the called. Yeah. None of us are qualified for it, none <laughs> of us are able to do it, yeah. but the Lord works through imperfect people. I was reminded of Hebrews when you were speaking, Robert, when it's just saying, having confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, mm. that will be of no benefit to you. Amen. Do you get baptised? How do you, do you actually get sprinkled? Or do you get baptised, actually, in the church? Or how, 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 what's happened with you two? Well, me specifically? Well, yeah, the two, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The two of us. So, well, we baptise infants as well. We believe that in covenant children, that they're entitled to the sign of baptism. Um, most of the time, that is just sprinkling with water, although... It's not that we say we don't do immersion. We can do immersion. It's just that we believe that immersion is not strictly necessary. <laughs> then we, should, we, can, we can still go on in unity and love, but that's fine. Yeah. No, I feel that you're, there's one that will be more power to the Holy Spirit. There will be more power, you know, if you sort of obey that command. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> but uh, no, can I thank these guys? I'm just uh, keeping an eye on the time. Can I thank Callum and Phil and Brian for giving up their time to, to come and join uh, the discussion tonight? Hopefully, you found it interesting, um, uh, giving a little bit more insight to us guys as, as ministers in the area. Um, you know, and hopefully, we've answered uh, and wrestled with some of your questions tonight openly and honestly. Uh, can we thank you for coming? It's been great to see the church so well filled. Uh, and maybe as we close, can we pray together uh, and then we'll part. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. We thank you that we are one in Christ Jesus. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had this evening to discuss and deliberate and to think and uh, to look uh, at issues and topics uh, which are heavy on our hearts. And Father, we pray that as we have answered those to the best of our ability, that they have been honoring to you, that they have edified your people and encouraged them, and, uh, Father, that they have grown in their nurture and understanding. Father, would you help us as churches to continue to unite in the gospel, Heavenly Father, and that we would see that reality as on earth as it is in heaven uh, become a reality in this world that we live and work and pray and do life in. Father, I thank you for my brothers. I thank you for our uh, respective churches gathered here, and we pray your richest blessing on us as we part now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you very much, folks. If you still need a quick coffee in the, for the road home or a biscuit, uh, please do help yourself. Thank you very much. <laughs>